Well, there was a lot left out, obviously. <laughs> Anybody that's uh, read the history of World War II or uh, followed it in any detail knows that it was a lot more complicated than you can compress into uh, one hour. And particularly when these uh, films were made by uh, many, many people right. and they were put together in a composite. You were there for part of the story that we saw. You were involved in the, you were in, a, in one of the uh, groups that broke the Siegfried line. You were in Paris. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your experiences? Well, most of what you uh, saw on these films today uh, was not part of what I participated in. I arrived in Europe as a second lieutenant of infantry five months before the war, in January, before the war ended uh, in May. Uh, at that time, for all practical purposes, as I returned home and read repeated histories of the war, I realized that uh, it was over. Uh, you saw on some of the films today, the old men and young boys. Most of what we faced in combat, uh, those were the German troops. Uh, most of their military supplies had been wiped out because of the bombing. What supplying they had was done by horse and wagon. But the most severe fighting I was involved in was at the Siegfried Line, which was a German fortified defense along the German border. The French had built what they referred to as the Maginot Line, and these were very formidable <coughs> fixed defenses. You saw pictures of tank traps today, concrete bunkers that traps that uh, tanks could not uh, come through or over. Uh, they were backed up by concrete pillboxes that were, we found out, uh, six feet reinforced concrete. And they were connected by trenches. And it was very, very difficult uh, to breach this line. Once it was done though, uh, Hitler had built uh, autobahns, they called them. Four lane, multi-lane highways all over Germany. Uh, they had one completely behind the Siegfried line, just a few miles to provide supplies and bring troops to the front. And so once we breached the Siegfried line and reached the Autobahn, then the armor and vehicles could be turned loose and move very fast. And that's what happened. But it took us a, by unit a week to breach the portion of the Siegfried line uh, where we attacked. And uh, I happened to be in this ditch uh, and looked down and I had never seen a higher ranking officer uh, before a lieutenant colonel was the highest rank. That was my battalion commander, a West Point lieutenant colonel. I looked down and in combat you did not wear your military symbols. You didn't see them dressed like you saw pictures of General Patton and General Eisenhower. Uh, it was very concealed. You'd have you on your collar. Everything else looked just like any other GI. But I looked down to my left and I saw a one, st a one star general, one star on the shirt collar. And it was the, the assistant division commander. And he had come up to the front. This was about the second day of our attack. And uh, he said, Lieutenant, what's the problem here? <laughs> and I said, General, uh, we've been machine gun from everywhere. Uh, the Germans were sending 88s over our head and the story was, and we found that that was true, they had a horrible sound. These were German artillery. Some felt better than what we had. And they made this horrendous sound. And the story was that if you could hear this sound, it had missed you. <laughs> the one you didn't hear is the one that got you. And the way we finally got through the Siegfried line, one of the friends that I met in Comeback, a 
lieutenant from uh, Texas A&M. And by the way, Texas A&M is getting a lot of uh, publicity recently because of their football team and their win last year over Alabama and their close loss to Alabama this year. But there were more officers in the U.S. Army in World War II from Texas A&M than any other military institution. It's one of the six senior military academies in the United States along with our own North Georgia University. And I'm a graduate of North Georgia when it was a two-year military college. And I came from there to the, to the university. But I did not see, to answer your question, Mary, much of what you saw in these films. Uh, I didn't go through the German civilians that we saw. Obviously, it didn't uh, particularly welcome us. But even though the war was over, we were getting people injured every few days and some killed. And one of the stories that I tell that I think that I've said many times, my mother and father were devout Christians and they prayed every day or more than one day for my safety and the safety of others. And uh, I think this helped bring me through situations I'm about to describe. Uh, when we went through the Siegfried Line from then on to the end of the war, I was in Austria and we were assigned and given maps and we were told where to go. And we mounted up on trucks and jeeps and we moved until we were shot at. And if you've ever been to Germany or France, you know that there are small, many small communities, some with just a few hundred people. Uh, they farm the land around it and they have trees that they call, of course, forest. And uh, when we got shot at, we'd get out in the, we'd have to get out of our vehicles and get out in the fields and start moving into the town. And then we would go down the street. I was walking down one side of the street. I do not know how I took that side of the street and another two lieutenant took the other side. And any of you that are familiar with the military, the infantry slogan was, follow me. The officers didn't go behind, they went first. And so I was leading a column of my unit down the street going from door to door because we were getting some shots fired from the church steeple, which typically they would put a sniper in the church steeple. And we ran into a few SS, which were the German elite soldiers, and there were a few of them scattered out, and they would rally what uh, old men and young people they could and try to defend these little towns. They weren't very effective at it, but they did injure and kill. On the other side of the street was a fellow lieutenant leading his unit. He stepped out of the doorway, the sniper shot and killed him. I could have been on that side of the street just as easy as he was there. And so I give thanks many times and have over the years, obviously, to the prayers of my mothers and fathers and uh, I see a lot of gray hairs in the audience today and I know many of you did the same thing for your husbands, children, relatives who were in the military. Well, Mr. Williams, you mentioned that you had uh, attended North Georgia College. Now, you, you that was before the United States had entered the war. And you were, so I want, I'm curious uh, about your life as a student before and after the war and being a college student with the war going on as someone who was going to go to officer candidate school, it, I'm sure it seemed inevitable to you that you would be at war. Would you talk a little bit North about Georgia that? North Georgia College was a two-year military college. I was uh, completing my sophomore year uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. I was at North Georgia College. I was lined up in the square. They required every student, and there were about uh, 400 of us at the time, to go to some church. And we would march. We could pick the church we wanted to, but we formed up on the square in Delonica, military formation, and marched to church. And uh, of course they had some small churches up there. <laughs> uh, they had to provide uh, speaker system so we could all participate in the survey. But that's where I heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor. And so that stopped everything, our training. I would have gone to, to uh, summer camp 
the next summer after Pearl Harbor and received a reserve commission in the infantry. But all of that was ceased after the attack on Pearl Harbor. I came on to the University of Georgia and entered as a junior and in advanced ROTC. And there were about 3,000 like myself in schools around the United States. And frankly, the Army, we found out later, didn't really know what to do with us. And we were taking over, there were, there were 42 infantry ROTC and a similar number of cavalry ROTC. They later became the armored, the armored uh, troops. And uh, we went uh, taking to Fort McPherson in Atlanta and inducted in the Army as privates and sent back to the University of Georgia. And it was very fortunate in that the Army paid our tuition, which was very low at that time. If there are students in the audience, and I see a few, the tuition at that time for, there were three, it was a quarter system. And you took three five-hour courses per quarter. And the tuition was $15 per five-hour course, or $45 for the entire semester. That wouldn't even buy you a book. Today. They, put, they, they, wouldn't. they put us in a boarding house on Lumpkin Street, uh, about a block below uh, Lumpkin and Broad. It was the Bickerstaff Boarding House. They put 42 of us in there, had an army <coughs> sergeant who looked after us. We did not have to wear uniforms except for our advanced military service on the, at the university campus. And the beanery at that time, which was the only cafeteria on the university campus, was where the School of Environmental Design later moved into, and it was right across the street. So it was very fortunate for me. And we've stayed so long, I had over 200 hours. It took 185 hours to graduate from the university, and I had over 200 because I was in the Army, and I did what they told me to do, and they said, go to school <laughs> and take military science and tactics. And that's what I did. But then they finally decided to send us to Fort Benning. And so I went to Fort Benning, when I got there, there was a, it was a three hour, I mean a three months training course to take a soldier and turn him into an officer and a second lieutenant. They called them 90 day wonders. <laughs> and they decided that that wasn't enough time and so just as I arrived there, they said you need four months. And so that helped me miss a little bit more of the war. And so I was at the university, most of what you saw in these films today, but I arrived in Europe long enough to be, uh, to be shot at, to have people in my units uh, injured uh, every week and some in our units uh, that uh, did not survive. Well, I'll be honest, I've kind of forgotten that y'all are here a lot of the time. And I, would, I, I could talk with Mr. Williams all afternoon, but I imagine there are as many questions out there as I have. So if anybody up there has a question for Mr. Williams? Yes, yeah. sir. When and where was the Siegfried Line breached? The breaching of the Siegfried Line? When well, and where? It was at Insheim, Germany, which is a small town. I went back with my, with my family 25 years later. And you heard the old saying, you can't go home again. Uh, it certainly changed so much in Europe that I did not recognize anything. And we only took a couple of days to go back and try to go to some of the places where I was in combat because so much had, uh, had changed. But it was near Insheim, Germany. But of course, the Siegfried Line extended the entire French-German border. And we had more than one attacks at the line. We didn't just breach it in one place. breached it in many places. But we saw here today about the Russians capturing Berlin. And I've read histories of the, of the war quite a number of them, as many of you have, and we could have taken Berlin very easily. Yeah. Uh, we, it was a military, a political decision made uh, to stop the U.S., British, and Allied forces uh, and allow the Russians to capture Berlin. And of course, as that turned out to be a, a, a mistake as we look back on it in history, but I'm sure those who participated in it at the time 
thought that was uh, uh, the right thing to do. And one of the reasons we did is I think we needed Russia to help uh, defeat Japan. And so it turned out uh, few, if any, of us knew about the atomic bomb. And many of our units, you'll be interested in this, uh, it was first over, first home. And being over at the end of the war, I had few points. It was a point system. And so when the war ended, uh, I was given an assignment. I was in the hospital with Yellow Jonas for a couple of months. Uh, but I was given an assignment to U.S. headquarters in Frankfurt. Uh, I was assigned as special service officer which was a very, very fortuitous situation for me. And I went from the lowest infantry unit to Supreme Headquarters. General Eisenhower was commanding general. Uh, he was there for about three months after I was there. And uh, so that was a very, very fortunate experience for me. I got to travel all over Europe. Uh, I went to Berlin. I chose not to go to any of the concentration camps. I could have. Uh, being at Supreme Headquarters, I had uh, uh, and could have orders cut for me to travel anywhere I wanted to go in Europe. I decided not to make those trips. I did go to several days of the Nuremberg trial and uh, uh, got to, in fact, I went for an entire week and listened to the testimony and uh, got to see all the German generals and some civilians who were on trial at that uh, at the Nuremberg trial. But I came back, I stayed a year, and I did not get back to the United States until July of the year after the war was over. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Where were you uh, on the actual day, VE day, and did you know it right away? On uh, VE day? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I was in uh, Austria, and uh, of course uh, I don't remember how fast the word came down when we think, but I, the two things I do remember very specifically is when uh, President Roosevelt died, we got the word for that, and then of course when the war ended, uh, the word came to us, and within just a couple of days, my unit was assigned to an army of occupation back in Germany. And so we were sent back to Germany to uh, occupy this small small town. And shortly after that, I received my assignment, as I said earlier, uh, to go to uh, Frankfurt. And one thing I've told about several times when I've been interviewed, I did a series with Claude McBride a number of years ago that the Alumni Society did and recorded a, a version of my military experience and uh, I got to know the principal aides to General Eisenhower because the way the military works, many of you have had served in the military, you go through a chain of command and so if General Eisenhower wanted to do anything uh, that involved a special service facility then it was customary to get in touch with the commanding officer. I got a call from Colonel Lee, the got several calls, but one who was full colonel and said General Eisenhower was having General Patton as his guest and he lived in a chateau about 15 miles out of Frankfurt for the weekend, it's his birthday. And when the war ended, there were a lot of high school uh, athletes, I mean, I don't mean high school, I mean college, outstanding college athletes and coaches all over Europe. And so all the armies, and the main headquarters had football teams. We played on Sunday afternoon, as the pros do here, and we took over a soccer stadium in Berlin and renamed it, I mean in Frankfurt, and renamed it Victory Stadium. And they came, he said they want to come to the football game uh, Sunday afternoon. And I said, fine, I'll make the necessary arrangements. And uh, later I thought about the fact that it would be a good idea to have the band play Happy Birthday and invite all the GIs to sing Happy Birthday to General Patton. And so I called Colonel Lee because you don't do those kind of things without getting the proper <laughs> approval. And Colonel Lee said, that's a good idea, Lieutenant, you do it. And so I still have the little slip of paper. 
And I was a budding radio announcer, I thought at that time. <laughs> and, uh, and so I made that announcement over the PA system of just what I have shared with you. One other thing that Colonel Lee told me, I don't remember the movie for some reason and didn't write it down, but we operated 17 theaters in the Frankfurt area. And I had a man who was a, ran theaters in the United States, he worked for special services, and they told me the movie that General Patton and General Eisenhower wanted to see. <clears throat> so I called this lieutenant that was in charge of the theaters and asked him if he had it. He said, no, we don't have it. And I said, told him just what I told you, and I said, well, find it. <laughs> and so when you were at Supreme Headquarters, I had a red line telephone on my telephone on my desk. They had a regular communication system for the military that went through the signal corps. But this was a high priority so that the commanding generals could reach each other instantly. <clears throat> when I arrived at this job in Frankfurt, they still had that telephone on my desk. <laughs> and if I picked up the telephone and called 7th Army in Heidelberg and some colonel answered the phone, it was the red line from Frankfurt. Supreme Headquarters, and well, he said, sir, to me. <laughs> so I knew we could get the film if it was in the entire European theater. So the lieutenant called me back a few hours later and said, <clears throat> it's the Paris section had it. Because we had a lot of uh, hotels in Paris that served as vacation places for the, for the troops as well as in Switzerland. So I didn't find out till later uh, that he ordered a plane, which he could do. He sent a plane to, from Frankfurt to Paris to pick up this film <laughs> and brought it back. And uh, we, showed the, we showed the film. And I don't know, I found out they called me one day. We had, there was one golf course in Frankfurt, and it had been bombed. Bob, a few stray bombs. And uh, we repaired those as well out in the suburbs. Downtown Frankfurt was obliterated. It was just bombed completely out. But U.S. headquarters, to digress a minute, was in the IG Farbing complex. And they had built in the mid-30s a campus-like setting for their headquarters. Uh, they had three, I think, six <coughs> or eight-story office buildings with, with uh, apartments around it. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to live in one of those. And, uh, but to get back to finish that story about the, uh, 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 and I getting off track and forgetting, having a senior moment about, and I probably talked enough. <laughs> no, sir. And we said this is going to wind up. At, well, at, I, at if you want to finish the, finish the story about golf, and I've got one more question for well, you. Well, anyway, they said he wanted to session. play golf, so we went out to this club, and uh, we only had, Two woods, five irons, and a putter. That was a special <laughs> service bag for the soldiers and officers in play. And so it was customary to meet. So when the general and his entourage arrived, and he traveled just like the president. They had a, a company of elite. They were all six feet plus, shiny uniforms, uh, fine looking soldiers. They guarded Eisenhower, and he traveled in this military entourage, and they'd roar up and they'd block off all the intersections when he went home at night and wherever he moved, just as they do for the President of the United States. And so we arrived out there, and they came in, and of course, so I saluted them, and uh, glad to have you, General, and I need to apologize because this is the only set of golf clubs that we have. And Eisenhower said, well, son, I haven't played much golf. <laughs> and, uh, I'll do my best with what you have. <laughs> yes, sir, and, uh, but I had uh, I enjoyed that experience. It, it, was, only, it was only about uh, two months later after Eisenhower and Patton were at the football game I described, General Patton was coming back from a hunting trip with General, uh, well, the, the commanding general of the 7th Army. And they had been hunting that weekend, and a truck hit his, uh, hit his staff car, and he lived about 10 days following, mm -hmm. following uh, that. But every, if you have to have a war, I've said this many times, 
You need people like Eisenhower and you need people like Patton. Mm -hmm. They were quite different. And I've quoted this many times that Patton made a speech to his troops when they were about to embark on D-Day from England. They'd been training for months, they were ready to go, and General Patton used a lot of words that you can't use in mixed company. Uh, but the thing I quoted, he finished his speech by, by saying, most of you will survive this war. And those of you that do can go home and you won't have to tell the people when they ask you, what did you do in the war? You won't have to tell them, I shovel manure at a camp in Louisiana. <laughs> you can tell them that you rode with the SOB George Patton. <laughs> Well, Mr. Williams, you mentioned that even um, when you were still overseas, as you were rallying the troops to sing happy birthday, that you were already at that point a budding radio announcer. So I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about your journalism career, and if you have, because I know we have a couple uh, journalism students in the audience, any advice for them today? Well, I do. Uh, I had uh, always liked radio. One of the first things I did in the 30s, you could, there were a lot of catalogs and you could order things. And so I saw in this catalog that you could get a microphone that you could hook to the back of your radio. And many of you will remember the radios in those days were in the living room and they were big console type affairs. And uh, the family sat in the living room and listened to the radio. I remember my mother, my father, worked in the post office in Gainesville. When he came home, he listened to Amos and Andy and Lowell Thomas and the News. And that was what he did. And we sat in the living room and did. And then my mother called us in and we, uh, and we served dinner. But I came back and uh, I wanted to be in radio. And I had an opportunity. I was from Gainesville, Georgia. There was one radio station in Gainesville and one radio station in Athens. And uh, I had met L.H. Christian, who was a, uh, an Athenian. Uh, his father owned Christian Hardware. And he was an engineer up at WGGA in Gainesville. <coughs> My mother did a program with a friend out there called Old Familiar Favorites. And uh, when I got back from the service, several of my friends told me, John Jacobs, some of you may know, that, uh, involved in radio until his recent passing, uh, invited me to join. And for some reason, my children have asked me this. And they said, well, we've already got this thing pretty well set up. I said, how much can I own of this? Well, I didn't have any money. I'd saved a little money uh, while I was in the service because he couldn't spend any. He'd ship it all home. I shipped every penny. All right, Bob, I'm not through. <laughs> but it looks like you are. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And any of the rest of you that feel you have to go, go ahead. Because Mary's encouraged me and my wife said, for God's sakes, please don't talk all the time. Uh, thank you all. Well, thank you. But anyway, to make it brief, I came back. Uh, uh, I did go to journalism school. It took a year to get our application. We filed for an application in Athens. I thought Athens would, it was a lot bigger city at that time, a town than Gainesville. And with the university here, it would have more opportunity, and particularly for sports. And so I went over to Elberton. The L.H. had gotten out of the Army and told him what the idea I had. And he said, well, I've been thinking about the same thing. So I said, well, let's start a station in Athens. So we did. Uh, he had more dollars to put into it than I did. and. Uh, and uh, from his father. And so it was named WRFC for R. Frank Christian. And we went on the air May the 1st, 1948. It took a year though, 47 to 48, to get our application approved by the FCC. And uh, I went back to school under the GI Bill uh, and uh, got a journalism degree. I took all journalism courses for three quarters and got a journalism degree in radio. I'll tell you something else interesting about radio and television. When the Peabody Awards are mostly, over the years that they've been in existence, uh, television. 
But in 1940, do any of you know uh, what the first television station, when the first television station in Georgia went on the air? 52. Oh. <laughs> 1948. It was the first TV station south of Washington, D.C. Radio was a big deal. And when I was growing up in the 30s, and many of you will remember these, some of, most of them are still around, but they had 50,000 watt clear channel stations, of which WSB, they, they called him Welcome South, brother. That's what the, the WSB stood, stood for. That could be heard over almost all of the eastern United States in, at night. And, and could be for most of the country at night. Could be heard over the, most of the southern states in the daytime. And I used to listen to the radio a lot, particularly at night. Uh, the big 50,000 watt stations in the south, many of you recognize them, they still in existence. WBT Charlotte, WSN Nashville, <coughs> WWL, Loyola University of the South, studios in the Roosevelt Hotel, way down yonder in downtown New Orleans. And I could go on and on about that, but I was in the radio business, uh, got into newspaper business and uh, helped start the Daily News, which we later sold to the Athens Banner Herald. I got into the outdoor advertising business and because Stan Henderson and myself, who were in the newspaper business and Stan, I mean the outdoor business together is here today, we had borrowed so much money from banks that after I sold my business to him uh, and some partners, I decided to help along with some other businessmen start two banks. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a very varied business career that all sprang from the journalism school. So those of you that are journalism students, uh, it's a good background for whatever you want to pursue. Mr. Williams, I want to uh, thank you. We have a small token for you. Um, this is a new book from Larry Dendy, Through the Arch. It's the history of the University of Georgia told through its architecture. Um, it's right out, so even this building is included. It's got a lot of great photographs. It's from the University of Georgia Press. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for doing that.